live from New Zealand, and you on the other side of the dateline, don't worry, I'm sure you'll catch up eventually, especially if you're accelerated by nuclear particles that happen to be floating in the air, which is unfortunate at the best of times. But, conveniently, this is the Vinnie Eastwood Show, the lighter side of genocide. Genocide, sorry. And we have an extremely special guest uh, lined up for today, ladies and gentlemen. He puts the G in gangster. It's G. Edward Griffin, uh, author who of <laughs> The Creature from Jekyll Island, World Without Cancer, The Capitalist Conspiracy, to name but a few of his great works, not to mention producing the uh, great documentary film, What in the World Are They Spraying? In which, incidentally, the New Zealand Parliament managed to get a, um, a cameo debut into their stupidity and arrogance and cackling away at something which is indeed very serious. So he's a man who knows how to deal with a little bit of criticism based upon telling the truth. I'd like to welcome him now to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. G. Edward Griffin, welcome. Thank you, Vinnie. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, I wanted to know, uh, just at this particular point in time with uh, currently how things are going, I mean... Would you like to explain yourself, perhaps, just a, a little bit to the audience, just a brief sum up? Mm, explain myself, you mean where I come from and what, what my goal in life is and how I spent my summer vacation, stuff like that? Basically, you've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a sense, uh, Betty, from listening to your introduction that you're a man of a great sense of humor, which is good to have in these days when it seems like the... The world is falling apart around us. So um, uh, forgive me if I join in with that frivolous note. But anyway, okay, who am I? Well, uh, I'm pretty much w what you see is what you get. I'm, I'm an old guy now. I was, uh, I was born in 1931. I've been uh, pretty much a serious observer and uh, communicator, writer, and um, things that I consider to be of great importance to the survival of uh, of not only at the human race, but the free human race. I don't think there's much you know, point in surviving if you're going to be in a condition of servitude or slavery, but I've been a serious observer of that for many years, and of course, if you hang around long enough, eventually uh, you manage to accomplish a few things. And So I've got all these books and television documentaries that I've managed to produce over the years. Most of them, Vinny, relate to uh, political issues, uh, not not partisan politics in in that sense, but geopolitical issues, social mm. issues, economic issues, and it's and going uh, beyond the uh, it's going beyond the small fish bowl vision. Broadcasting live from the future, from the fabulous fluoride head capital of Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, our very special guest, G. Edward Griffin, us jo joins us for two hours today, and uh, so immensely grateful. I can't believe it. Welcome back. Well, thank you. So where were we? We were talking about the difference between politics with a capital P and with a lowercase p, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, well, poly, poly meaning many and uh, ticks <laughs> meaning blood-sucking <laughs> insects. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, so when I say I, I'm interested in political issues, I don't mean issues like who you're going to vote for. That's, that's so far down the scale. Uh, by the time you get to, you know, as you, I'm sure, know this, Vinny, by the time you get to the issue of who you're going to vote for, all the decisions have been made. You know, all the real important decisions have been made, the candidates have been selected, and you're just being given a choice between a couple of ca candidates which have been thoroughly filtered. And uh, usually, at least here in our country, it makes very little difference which candidates you choose because they both uh, are beholden pretty much to the same power brokers. Yeah, so, they're, 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 like, they're like the little ghosts that they send out to do their bidding or kind of thing. Who are you going to call? <laughs> yeah, who are you going to call? Who are you going to vote for? And, uh, you know, in, under those conditions, uh, it seems like, especially today, people aren't voting for anybody. They're voting against somebody. They say, well, I don't, you know, I really hate the guy that's in office now. He's so bad. I don't care who you vote for. Anybody's got to be better than that. You know, that's the mentality. So they don't really know what they're getting. They, all they know is they hate what they got. And that's the mentality that I've been fighting against all my uh, my mature life and trying to, you know, pump some information and sunshine into these people so they'll start to wake up and uh, and realize that there are principles involved here. It's not the people, it's the principles that they uh, represent. So anyway, that's sort of a, a half-baked description of what I do. 
uh, I try and stir the pot. I try and get people to think. And uh, once in a while, you know, you when you're stirring things around, you stir up a hornet's nest. And so I've been chased by a few bees, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> so what's the buzz from the bees these days? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, we've got these uh, simultaneous crises, I keep saying. Uh, we've got the, the tsunamis, the earthquakes in New Zealand, and, and uh, we've got the, uh, the, the, the nuclear crisis, the economic crisis. We've got the food shortage crisis. We've got the, the, the oil price crisis. We've got the, uh, the everything crisis, basically. Right. And uh, I, I, I always, always think that when huge things are happening globally and uh, they're all happening simultaneously... I usually am suspicious that there is a coordinated um, effort going on here. And uh, if there was a coordinated effort behind uh, many large worldwide simultaneous crises, who would want something like that? And more to the point, why would they be doing it? You know, what are they trying to get out of this? Well, precisely, that's, uh, those are the kinds of questions I think more people need to be asking. There's no doubt about it when you start reading the literature that is put out by some of the, the biggest movers and shakers uh, in the world. And by that I mean organizational movers and shakers. Here in the States we have an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations, and it's a relatively small group of people. Only about 4,000 people belong to it. But uh, those, those individuals are in the power centers of this country. In fact, many have called that the hidden uh, government or the hidden rulers of America. And it's really not a bad um, uh, description because these people are really in the saddle. You find an inordinately high percentage of uh, presidents of the United States who are members of this group, vice presidents, candidates for every important office you can think of, uh, Supreme Court justices, senators, congressmen, uh, heads of universities, uh, heads of the great um, media centers, ABC, CBS, NBC, and just to go on down the line, labor unions, church organizations, all the power centers of society, which really determine the way the nation will go, are dominated uh, by people from this one little organization. And this is no accident. You'd have to be a fool to say, well, my goodness, look how the chips fell on that one. No, these, these people know that uh, a human being is, a, is sort of a herd animal. He has this herd instinct. He, he goes into groups, and he, he aligns himself with organizations, and he follows leaders. So the whole trick there, if you want to control a nation without the nation really being too much aware that it is being controlled. What you do is you um, you try and capture uh, control of these power centers of society at the top, yeah. And then the masses that belong, uh, you know, the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, the labor unions, and so forth, they, they just go along with whatever their leaders say, and they don't realize that those people at the top all have somewhat of a common agenda. So. Uh, that's why I say by the time you get to vote for a candidate, uh, the important decisions have been made. And, um, and I, I kind of wandered from my track there. The point is that these people, when you read the literature of that they uh, publish for themselves, write the books that they've written in their younger days, and so forth, you find that they're very aware of this need to direct the masses. And, in, in fact, there's one very interesting book was published by a college professor here in the United States by the name of Carol Quigley. It's called, um, um, let's see, I have to stop and think for a moment of it. He, uh, Carol Quigley, by the way, was the pre professor uh, who taught political science and history to our President Clinton when he was a student at Georgetown University. Yeah, and I've heard the book the is name. called Tragedy and Hope. And it's oh, big, yes. Yeah, it's a big, thick book. And in there, as, first of all, um, Professor uh, Quigley is, is very, very uh, supportive of this organization, this Council on Foreign Relations, which is an outgrowth of a Cecil Rhodes uh, heritage. Cecil Rhodes, when he died, left his fortune to create a secret society. And in the United States, the branch of that secret society is called the Council on Foreign Relations. And in your country and in Great Britain and many other countries which are more closely aligned with Great Britain, 
it has a different name, uh, usually called the Royal Institute for International Affairs. But in the United States, you know, the Americans didn't want anything connected with the word royal, so they changed the name, called it the Council on Foreign Relations. It's all the same group, different branches in different countries. And uh, in, in any event, uh, Quigley was the sort of the historian of this secret society, and that's what his book was all about. And he says very clearly that he is all in favor of it. He says he has nothing objectionable about it. You know, these are the people who are ruling the world from behind the scenes. He says his only objection was that they preferred to remain hidden from view. And he said, I think these people deserve credit for what they've done. I wish they would just sort of come out and be more open about what they're trying to do. Other than that, Quigley was totally on board. Quigley himself was a collectivist and believed in all the goals of the New World Order based on the model of collectivism. And, uh, and I, believe it or not, I'm really leading up to something here. Um, in his book, about halfway through, Quigley raises a very important question. He says, how is it that we, who we are the elite, of course, we who rule the world from behind the scenes, how do we allow the people, the masses, to, to have the illusion that they are running the world. They, you know, clamor for something called democracy. They think, they like to think that they are controlling their own political destiny, and we have to give them the vote in order to keep them happy. But how do we give them this vote and yet don't give them the power to change anything? And he answers the question. He says it's very simple. He says all you have to do is just have two political parties, let them choose up, between the two, and we control them both. Bingo. There it was. And uh, that's the way the real world is uh, today. And the unfortunate thing is that only about one one-hundredth of one percent of the population knows it. Yeah, it's like a... Um it's like a movie theater that has two entrances, one on either side of each other, and uh, there's a person uh, behind each door claiming that the thing behind their door is a different movie theater to what the other guy is claiming, but they only open one door at a time, so people would never know the difference. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it's kind of like uh, being a really a rich fellow, and you, you buy a baseball team, and you think, well, this is good. And then uh, you decide uh, five years later you buy another baseball team. I own two baseball teams. What happens the day when both teams play each other? Not too bad. You, can, you can't lose, can you? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much the way it works. Well, maybe is that why they, they just kind of hate everybody else because they, they just can't lose and they just don't care. So it's like, hey, well, if everybody else, let's just kill them all. <laughs> Take over. Yeah. Well, I think they do care. I think they have a definite plan in mind, and that's kind of where I was going in the beginning of my rambling monologue, is that they have written about uh, where they want to go, and they do care. And uh, what they're trying to build is a, is a world government. They fondly call it the New World Order. But basically what it is is a world government but it's not just any old world government, certainly not based on the concepts of freedom or representative government. It's based on the concept of collectivism, which means that it's a top-down type of system where all the decisions are made at the top by the ruling elite, and the, and the masses at the bottom are allowed to think that they're participating in their own political destiny, uh, so they can't complain about everything. They say, well, we voted for our leaders, and so therefore he's our man, and we can't complain if he messes us around because we voted him in. And, but meanwhile, the decisions are not made by the people at all at the bottom. It's made at the top. And uh, well, so... That's how so it is. How, how do they kind of uh, claim that it's collectivism if nobody collectively has a say about what goes on? <laughs> well, the the uh, actual you see the, the definition of collectivism has to be uh, perhaps studied a little bit. There are two only two major philo philosophies in the Western world for uh, for government. Now, there, in some parts of the world, you still have the I mean theocracy, where you know, supposedly a government is is being led by somebody who is the representative of God. And then in some primitive parts of the world, you may still have plain old um, barbarism where there's no question about it. The, the guy with the biggest sword or the, the most guns, he rules and all of that. But for most of the Western world, we have this thing called 
democracy, and this idea is that, you know, the majority should rule. So um, that's an important part of the equation. You've got to keep that in place in order to keep the people docile and happy and content with their lot. No matter how bad it gets, they can say, well, it's our government. It wasn't imposed on us. We did it. And so they're, they, you know, they become docile and manageable. So the whole trick is, is how to keep that illusion alive. And uh, they do it by simply telling the people over and over again that everything is done for their own good. And that's the, ba- the basis of collectivism is, one of the basis anyway, perhaps the most important, is that the individual is uh, unimportant and the group is all important. The individual must be sacrificed if necessary, they say, for the greater good of the greater number. See, now there's the trick right there. The problem is, is that the group is full of nothing but individuals, so to an attack on one is an attack on all. That's exactly. It, when, when you think about it, there is no such thing as a group. An amazing thought. The group really doesn't exist. There's no such thing. You can't touch a group. You can't uh, see a group. All you can see are individuals. The, the word group is an abstraction. It, it occurs in the brain only. It's an abstraction. It's a concept for many individuals, just like the word forest. Forest doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a forest. There are trees. You can touch trees, but you can't touch a forest because it's an abstraction. It's a mathematical concept for many trees. So when you say you're going to sacrifice individuals for the greater good of the group, what you're doing is you're sacrificing the only thing that really exists for something which is, a, is an abstraction, and in the end you wind up sacrificing all the individuals anyway. So well, that, that's you're quite like right. completely insane then, isn't it? It's like this, this um, psychopathic mathematical probability mechanism that demands that all people be killed in order to suit a particular idea of what should be there. <laughs> yes, yeah. and see, the rest of that trick is that once you convince the masses that, yes, the, the group is more important than the individual, uh, then the next question is, well, who decides what's in the best interest of the group? Ah, uh, well, there has to be some leader, doesn't it? And, well, I mean, I think the leaders should lead by example. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Well, they never do. <laughs> no, somebody has to be wise and uh, make all these uh, decisions because, you know, the people are too dumb. They would probably get it all messed up, they think. So they, the rulers, are the wise ones. They've been to school, and, and so they'll make those decisions for us. And so you're right back to the beginning of history where you've got an absolute ruler and the people are nothing but dirt under their feet. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and we trust these people implicitly, don't we? And what happens when you trust something that it has very, very dark intentions and certainly doesn't understand or care about, if that, if that be the case, your particular situation? Because they don't view you as a person or an individual. They see you as just part of some group that they want to, you know, do certain things to. So it, it lends itself to this kind of uh, manipulation of morality so that anything that once was good is now flipped on its head and becomes actually a mechanism for doing harm. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, the yeah. idea of protecting one from shepherding people or, or uh, really trying to uh, be altruistic in a way to try and make things move along in a very nice and pleasant fashion has instead gone into a nice and pleasant fashion for me with everybody else being cut off at the knees. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Well, it's the old idea that the majority should rule, and that's what I was taught in school. It seemed okay at the time. After all, that's democracy. You know, I was, I was bombarded with all those words. I didn't really understand what they meant. I certainly hadn't read any serious history at that time. So whatever they told me, that's assumed that was correct. And, uh, you know, democracy is not such a hot idea after all, when you find out. Uh, here in this country, uh, when uh, our uh, founding fathers, as we call them, and when they drafted the Constitution of the United States, they went to great lengths to explain that democracy is not what they wanted. And in fact, in their debates and in their private papers, they said democracy is the very worst form of government, because it always leads to anarchy and mob rule and uh, rule by elite groups, uh, demagogues who can whip up the masses, and they say that the individual's rights and liberties are always trampled.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show on American Freedom Radio. And incidentally, the Vinnie Eastwood Show.com, proudly brought to you in collaboration with GuerrillaMedia.co.nz, New Zealand's unconventional news. This show is the lighter side of genocide because if you lose your sense of humour about all this terrible crap holler, you'll go friggin' nuts. And believe me, I should know. I almost went nuts before I discovered my sense of humour back again. Welcome back also to our uh, amazing, fabulous and various other nice adjectives special guest, G. Edward Griffin, coming at us live from the United States. Welcome back, sir. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Vinny. Uh, I love your sense of humour and I, I have to be careful because I have a very bad one myself. And you I do? Was thinking, I was thinking while you were saying that it's a good thing you've... Um, got your sense of humor because it's kept you from going crazy and i was going to ask you are you sure no no i'm not actually <laughs> <laughs> i constantly review the process you know <laughs> <laughs> anyway but you're quite right yeah you have to maintain a, a sense of humor or you you get very very morbid in your thinking processes that's for sure yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's there's kind of the idea that you might get a little bit freaked out if you learn too much information about something. Like, what if uh, you found out that I don't know your 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 father was a pedophile or so, or something like that? You know, some real yeah. bad bad information that otherwise right. you know you would have been fine not knowing. Yeah, yeah. There's that instinct. We just we just don't want to know if uh, if it's bad news. That's yeah. True. But ironically enough, we do want to know if it's bad news because everybody flicks on the TV the second somebody says live earthquake in Christchurch or or uh, live, you know, uh, towers flying into the World Trade Center, terrorist attack on, you know. People do actually tune into tragedy, right? And I think it distracts them from uh, their own tragic existence where they don't have any control over everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's In fact, true. it's the opposite way around. Everything has control over them. <laughs> yeah, right, you are. Yeah. And that's the essence of freedom, really, isn't it? Is being able to have some semblance of control over your life, you know? Some, some semblance of independence, but it's gradually been eroded away now to nothing. I mean, uh, back in the... Back in the 30s, during the other Great Depression, <laughs> I think we're about to head into an even bigger one. Uh, people uh, mostly grew in their own food in, uh, in rural areas and were relatively self-sufficient. And now, most people live in cities. They 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 aren't growing jack. Not even yeah. so much as a pinch of basil out of a can. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's so, so what's true. Gonna, and what's going to happen to all these people? You know, I mean, uh, are we heading towards that long talked about global genocide? You know, is is it currently in full swing? Like, have they, have they just dropped the hammer here with uh, this Japanese crisis, and then they're going to just launch all the others at the same time? Well, there's a, a pretty heavy implication uh, to that question, and uh, if I understand it correctly, Vinny, are you suggesting that maybe the uh, the earthquakes and the tsunamis and all that were sort of uh, engineered and not a natural process? I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot of speculation on it. Um, yeah. uh, when the quake happened, I had Benjamin Fulford uh, on the on the show. I'm not I'm not sure what you think of him, but uh, uh, he he said that he had a conversation with the Japanese official the night before, who warned him that there was going to be an earthquake the next day, and he recorded the conversation. But I didn't I didn't hear the recording, so mm. I don't I don't know. But there there's a there's possibilities and, and uh, certainties in a lot of people's minds about it. Me, personally, I'm just trying to figure out the world. And uh, my three favorite words are, I don't know. And my three most hated words are, I don't care. <laughs> yes, very, very true. Well, we do know that the, uh, I hate to say this, but our own government here, the United States government, has been working for many, many years to acquire control over technology of that kind. I mean, starting at the more sublime level that they wanted to have control over the weather. And, uh, and I think they have. I think by now the, um, the sort of black box agencies have figured it all out. They know how to control the weather pretty much either by dumping certain chemicals into it and or uh, interacting those chemicals with uh, strong electromagnetic waves that can be generated from certain pulse points on the planet, such as up in Alaska, where we all know they have a huge array of, of antenna that uh, 
every once in a while get flipped on and draw so much power that it just dims the light uh, in the cities around there. And not many cities, but the one that's there, that the lights go dim. And just millions and millions of watts of electrical power being pumped up into the uh, atmosphere through an antenna array, which is laid out in such a way that they can uh, selectively direct voltages to certain points in that array and therefore create a directional beam. They can direct it both up and down and left and right and that sort of thing. So what's going on? You know, they say, well, we're just doing research. They've been researching up there for, what, 15 years or so? <laughs> Top kind of like the, <laughs> kind of like the same it. kind of research that <laughs> the Japanese do, say, that they're, <laughs> they're doing when they're doing whaling. Oh, we're just researching. Yeah. Spear yeah. them! Spear yeah. them! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's all research, you understand. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's why that's why it's in charge of the military. I I know that the military is well known for being a research organization. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it, it, that's true, by the way. But it's always with one purpose in mind, and that's the military purpose. And that's the point. So anyway, I'm rambling. But the point is, we know that the governments, the United States government, is not the only one. Uh, we know that China and and Russia, for sure, have been engaged in quote, research of this kind for many, many years. So when governments get to be huge and they get empire on the mind, they begin to think along these lines. And uh, I'm sure that any one of those uh, would love to have the technology to be able to cause an earthquake or a hurricane or, or uh, whatever, you know. They, they would love to have it. Yeah, well, I, I would assume that if you've got the power to create earthquakes, and I, and I believe that there was even uh, some kind of uh, general or, or something saying to the Congress or, or whatever that they had tectonic weapons. And uh, there's a lot of talk about it. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that most cases, when there's a lot of talk about stuff, when there's a lot of chatter on the web, there's never nothing to it. There always yeah. has to be something to it, yeah. um, even if it's not the something that you thought it would be in the first place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I should make it very clear, having said what I did a moment ago, that I am not one who believes that I have any information that would cause me to think that the earthquake in Japan was, in fact, engineered by someone, because I just don't know. I'm just trying to say that uh, I'm sure that the larger governments in the world would love to have that technology. And if they, why would they love to have it? It's because they would use it. But then you get all kinds of questions of, well, why would any government want to use this against Japan and so forth? And you get into, uh, you know, endless questions, and I, I don't think you can answer any of them. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, House Bill uh, 2977, October 2001. Uh, proposed a ban on the use of weather weapons, uh, yeah. psychotronic weapons, and tectonic weapons, and uh, all capabilities of uh, HARP, apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, we had uh, AC Griffith on the show uh, talking about scalar weaponry, and, and uh, HARP now has just been reduced to an over the. Um, over-the-horizon sort of radar system, and uh, scalar is what they do the damage with. And there's things that uh, happen when scalar weaponry is used, like uh, rainbow-coloured clouds, sonic booms coming out of the air, pe uh, the appearance of um, sort of meteorite-type-looking things. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, of the, all of those uh, three signs were, uh, were seen above uh, Christchurch uh, in New Zealand uh, before the earthquake happened. So there's just... A whole lot of um, things about this, and we've had an investigative reporter on it too. Um, so it, it's it's looking more than likely that not only um, have they got these weapons now, um, but they but they are using them, and they they are in the process of doing with it. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Japanese earthquake was uh, some kind of the um, like a, a a trigger, a domino effect. These uh, the New World Order, I find, really loves setting dominoes off. You know. <laughs> well, yes, and. You know, since we're speculating on this too, and I, you know, it is just speculation on this part of it. But of uh, when, if if you and I were in charge of developing systems like this, uh, it, it wouldn't be enough just to um, have a bunch of scientists sitting around with uh, blueprints and and building a lot of funny-looking pieces of equipment. We'd have to test it, wouldn't we? We'd have to test it. 
in order to know how to use it. And so it's possible, I think, that uh, some of these things that are happening around the world are not necessarily happening because some region was targeted because we hate them, we want to conquer them or whatever, but, well, you've got to test it on somebody, you know? <laughs> and so, well, let's, uh, let's throw a dart and see where it lands. Oh, well, let's test it over there and see what happens. Uh, I know that in terms of biological uh, systems, biological warfare systems, that certainly has happened. In England, it's happened in the United States, where those governments have tested uh, uh, very toxic agents on their own people. They'll pick some little town, and they'll say, well, don't tell anybody, but we're just going to let loose these little germs there and, and uh, track it and see how many people get sick and see how long it takes to get from point A to point B and so forth. They do it on their own people just yeah. because they have to test it to see how, in case the day ever comes when they want to use it, really have to use it, they'll know how. It's because they found a loophole in uh, the informed consent laws. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you might say a loophole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, a loophole that you can drive a truck full of viruses through. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the, 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 just the the psychopathy of government and the psychopathy of intelligence organizations, businesses, and and all of these sort of things, which have essentially. They've all amalgamated together in some way, shape, or form, like this enormous organizational human transformer, where it's all kind of um, come together to this one enormous, giant, corporate, political, military, industrial beast to enslave humanity. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm glad you're laughing, and I, you got me scared to death because I think you described it pretty well. I never thought of this this monstrous thing as being a huge transformer, but that really is what it is. Um, I think what we're <laughs> dealing with here is is a a division of the human race into two classes. There's the the predator class that we're talking about that always have an affinity to each other because they support each other. Uh, in one way or another. May, they may have different, slightly different goals, but they're all predators. Uh, and so they, um, they may fight with each other for, for turf or dominance, but they'll certainly work together uh, to, uh, to enslave the other class, which is us, unfortunately. We, we we're far more numerous than they, but we don't have any power. The predators know instinctively that in order for them to succeed, they've got to reach for power. And the greatest source of power in our world today is uh, is government. So predators always instinctively move into government, and uh, that's where they are. Uh, the uh, the yeah, you know the old like joke. The guy said, well, "The Bart, uh, the not the Bart, the the uh, bank robber was arrested." And somebody said, "Why do you rob banks?" And he says, that's "Because that's where the money is." And uh, pretty obvious. And so you say, "Why do predators go into government?" And it's because that's where the power is. That's where they can be predators and, and do it legally and not be punished for their crimes. Oh, yeah. Get, they get off on it and they get away with it. You know, you can't ask for better than that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and this is the thing about laughing about it is because it's so terrible. Technically, there's nothing you can do right at this particular moment. And laughter is the strongest form of denial that's known. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you've got it mastered. So, <laughs> I, I, I think I've, I've figured something out, but I could be wrong. You know, um, yeah. my, my belief is, um, my strong belief is that everything I, I know to be true is, in fact, wrong. All right. I just haven't seen the evidence to disprove it yet. I mean, that's my that's my basic assumption. Mm -hmm. Until somebody proves wrong what I've what I'm thinking about with some with some decent info, I'll just keep kind of uh, going on that rudder, but very tentatively. You know, of course. I don't of want course, to, yeah. I don't want to go fly off the handle and go absolutely freaking nuts. I mean, my goodness, I might take over the country and and force it into a fascist dictatorship. Wouldn't that be lovely? Oh, wait, we've got that one anyway. <laughs> and I can end the planet in a holocaust because I can just do it that way. Yeah. One thing that um, we really kind of have to, oh, I don't know, come to grips with as a free humanity is to realize the kind of scum that hate us because we're free. And not in the way that George Bush says it, you know, oh, those terrorists, they just hate us when they're free because those terrorists don't freaking exist. In fact, most of the ones that died in the towers are still walking around somewhere, still flying airplanes and pumping oil and stuff like that, suffering identity theft. <laughs> 
but at the moment, what we really have to um, be conscious of is agendas that are in play. Okay, who benefits from what incident, where and how it happens. All of this is something that the average person should know, because if the average person knew all this stuff, it wouldn't be going on because they would be subject to the bright lights of publicity. G. Edward Griffin, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think about that? I mean, is it possible, right, as an alternative media, as a patriot, as a, as a truth movement-ish type person, to get this information out there to such effect that we can literally see the results coming back at us, resulting in uh, legislation or, or or actual progress? I mean, uh, just, in, just in recent years, other than... Um, our, my my videos and uh, my radio show and all of that. I mean, my my personal interest is to try and uh, I don't know create some sort of a change in in society. But I don't see that change. I, I mean, I see I see statistics of my work and all of that, but I don't see any change going on out there. What about you? Well, Vinny, I think that, uh, that there is change going on, but uh, uh, it's so frustratingly slow and that I certainly share your view. I wondered sometimes after having spent, what, 50 years of my life uh, on this, whether or not I've really done anything. But when I look back and I, I consider um, what things were like out there back in the 1960s, the beginning of 1960, when I first, my flame got lit and I started to frazzle and burn all over the place and trying to wake people up, and shed some light, Nobody knew anything and didn't want to know that life was too good. What are you talking about? A problem? Who? Us? We'll never have a problem. Look how life, how great life is. Uh, business is booming and we're having a lot of fun and so forth. And then I look at it today and I realize that there is a really a ground-shaking awakening going on. Now, unfortunately, I think the reason for that is because things are, are beginning to go sour. I think had um, you know life continued without any ripples and and uh, no uh, economic problems of any kind, uh, no acts of terrorism or assumed acts of terrorism, and, and and without any of these great crises that you were mentioning earlier before, it's possible that the people would still be pretty much in a state of slumber and not particularly wanting to wake up. But that's not the way it is. So mm -hmm. I kind of look at it as though we're uh, watching two, uh, two opposing forces, um, and uh, something's got to give. I think we're coming to the, the tipping point. Um, and I think that the worse things get, and I'm certainly not hoping for that, but I see that it's going to get worse, I believe. The worse things do get, the more people will wake up and say, what the heck caused this? And they'll take an interest. For the first time in their lives, they'll take an interest in some of these big issues. But the big question then is, is it too late? Will it be too late to do anything about it? Boy, I wish I knew the answer to that. I'm counting on it not being too late. But there's one more thing I'd like to, uh, observation I'd like to make on this, and that is I think that we get... Uh, uh, unrealistically impatient. We want to see change now. Here, you know, here in the United States, people say, well, uh, uh, can we turn this around by the next election? You know, that's the focus point, the next two years or the next four years. And I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, it's taken a hundred years or more for to unwind the system. I don't think you're going to wind it back up and get everything back in place in two years or four years. We have to have the long view of history. And once you focus on that for a while, and you, you say, darn it, I wish that weren't true. But finally you say, okay, if the long view of history is what really counts. Maybe I won't see it all uh, straighten out in my lifetime, but my grandkids probably could. And if I do my part, and then my kids do their part, and then the grandkids do their part, we can turn it around. And if we have this longer view of history, and it's not just me, 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 and how does it affect me in my lifetime, then things begin to level out a little bit, and it becomes more gratifying to see little changes take place. Put in one stone, one foundation stone, just one, but it's, an, it's one, and it's right next to the one we put in a few months ago. So now we've got two. Now we can have to look ahead in our minds and think how wonderful it will be when there's a whole edifice built upon those stones. Um, once you get used to this kind of long-range thinking, it becomes very satisfying. 
And uh, it, it becomes very clear to me that we have already won. It's just a question of time uh, for the world to figure it out. Well, that's exactly what I say is, is that uh, we've already won and we're just going through the motions here. And um, essentially, it's going to be like a bowel movement type motion, you know, where everybody's going to go through an awful lot of stuff that you wouldn't wish to be poured on them. Hey, but it's going to happen anyway. And uh, the, the concept of waking up on time, I don't, I don't think it actually matters. If you wake up, you wake up and that's the right time for you, you know. Well, that's um, right. You, you can't unring the bell. Uh, you can't go back. Uh, once once you get the picture, you'll never not get the picture again. Hour number two of the Vinnie Eastwood show, probably uh, the best show that we've ever done so far. Uh, but that's not saying much. My very, my very special guest joining me live from the United States is uh, author and uh, documentary filmmaker, G. Edward Griffin. Uh, absolutely astounded. Uh, and uh, delighted to have him on for the full two hours today. Uh, welcome back, mate. Well, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes. Now, 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 important issues of the day. What are people supposed to really do um, about these particular crises all, all coming together? I mean, uh, is it just about kind of hunkering down and getting everything sorted right now, to, like bug-out positions, uh, food supplies... You know, detached energy. What what should people be doing right about now? Well, I really like that question. Uh, I think it depends on who you are, what your personality is. Um, you can be totally passive and defensive and say, well, nothing I can do about it. Things are happening. I'll just have to hunker down, as you say, and protect myself and my family, get my guns and my groceries and head for the hills or whatever it is. Just be defensive and hope that somehow, somehow you're going to survive all this. I don't, I don't mean to really belittle that, because uh, you do have to think in terms of defending yourself and your family. But in all honesty, I don't think that that will really solve the problem. Uh, if you're looking for a long-term solution, which is the only real solution, you've got to take the initiative. You've got to take the system back. You've got to not just be wringing your hands. You have to go into politics. You have to recapture control of the power centers that, is, that are now in the hands of these collectivists who are running the show. We've got to recapture the ship. The ship has been captured. The captain has been thrown in the brig. Uh, these guys running around with the uniforms uh, running this ship that we're on, they're, they're not the original crew. We've got to uh, replace them. And uh, so that's the reason, Vinny, that I, some years ago I formed an organization called Freedom Force International. And the whole purpose of this group is to uh, recapture control of the power centers of the respective countries that we're in. We have members now in 68 different countries. And the goal is the same, the problem is the same, the solution is the same. And that is to... to uh, get back in there where the decisions are made, and, and we're the ones that should be making the decisions. Up until now, all we do is write letters to our elected representatives, and we sign petitions. Maybe we'll send a little check into somebody that seems like they're doing a good job. You know, like, oh, well, we'll do our little part. No, 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 no. We have to devote our lives to this thing. We have to become really serious about taking back the, the system. Now, my very special guest uh, for the duration of this hour is G. Edward Griffin, the author and filmmaker. And uh, basically, if you wanted to uh, sort of point a stick at somebody who's at least made an enormous amount of impact in terms of getting the truth out to the masses. It's G. Edward Griffin. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Now, it's important to realize who you are because then, of course, uh, it gives you credibility, you know, because, you know, there'd be some people out there, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, what does the... Uh, the letter G actually stand for? A friend of mine wanted to know. I assumed it just meant gangster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't I wish I had something that exciting in my name. No, it stands for George. George. Yeah, but okay. my father's name was George, and my grandfather's name was George, and so that got a little monotonous. Yeah, okay, okay. I can see that happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we wanted to um, sort of break down for people... What is it that is going on uh, with the current state that is ruling society? I mean, um, and by this I mean uh, particularly the issuance 
of currency. Now, if you're listening to the uh, the song uh, just there before, it talked about they print a hundred bucks and loan it to you, but they don't print the interest on the loan, so there'll never be enough to pay off all the debt. This uh, this sleight of hand kind of uh, magical printing process, which is basically enslaving everybody. A lot of people don't understand exactly how that works. I was wondering if you could just kind of explain in a nutshell how the issuance of currency equals control over people's lives. Hmm. In a nutshell, well, I let's hope it's a, a big nut here because uh, that's a tough one to do in, you know, to right, do I'll accurately and to I'll... do quickly, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. How about a coconut shell, then? <laughs> coconut shell. That sounds alike. It's a little bit better, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, let's start with how does money control people. I think that's the easy part of it. We are economic animals. Uh, almost everything we do in the way of providing or consuming goods and services is um, done through an exchange with money. So everything of importance in our lives, well, no take that word importance out of it, but everything of economic uh, value to our lives is done through the medium of money. You know, uh, how well we live, what we eat, what clothes we have, how well we can educate our children, what kind of houses we live in, everything. So, uh, and, and people will do almost anything for money because it rep- money represents the ability to... Uh, uh, command the services of others. The more money we have, the more services we can we can command from others. So that's you know this is pretty basic stuff. Um, if uh, if you have an offer to be employed by a corporation and they're going to pay you substantially more than you're now earning, and especially if you're living kind of on a tight budget, you you might. Actually, most people would consider going to work for that company and accept the the offer, even though they may not approve very much of the company or the guy they're going to accept as the boss. They may think this guy is a this guy is awful. I don't want to work for him, but boy, that you know that offer of how much money they're going to pay me, I maybe I ought to do it. So people make compromises in return for money, and. Um, I've, I've known many people that have worked for corporations that really don't think much of the corporation at all. That they think it's unethical. They don't like the, the uh, culture in the corporation. They don't like the management style. Maybe they don't even like the product or service of the corporation, but they spend their lives working for it because that's the way they earn their money. Well, so that's the easy part. People will do almost anything for, for large amounts of money. Um, but now, how does that give the ruling elite the ability to control our lives? This is where it really gets interesting. It does so because it allows huge amounts of money to go into the pockets of those individuals who become the managers and directors of the power centers of society. And that is what controls our lives. In other words, uh, if we're working for a corporation uh, and the guy at the top of the corporation, the president and the vice president and the board of directors and so forth, are making huge amounts of money, they're going to pretty much uh, not going to rock the boat and uh, convert that corporation into an ethical corporation overnight. Uh, Maybe I'm not saying this correctly, but just imagine, I'll give you an example. Imagine we're talking about a large pharmaceutical company. I think by now, almost everybody should recognize that pharmaceutical companies have a horrendous track record. Uh, Time and time again, we find after some tortuous investigation that the company developed a new drug. They knew that it was toxic. They had all the research on it, but they buried the research, and they kept looking for new researchers to do new studies until finally they found one that said, hey, this stuff is perfectly safe. And they, that's the one they published, and they buried all the others. This happens so many times, it's, it's really the, it's, it's the custom and not the exception. And so now just imagine how many people working for that company are aware of that. There are a lot of people are aware of that. Do they resign? No, they don't. Because it's their paycheck. It's their business. 
And so when a, when a guy is appointed to the board of directors of this company or he's hired as an executive, does he say, hey, guys, we're going, we're going to change all this. We're, we're going to release the real report because we don't want innocent people dying. To heck with the profits. Let's show some ethics here. We don't want to kill people. That way they'd be knocked out of that corporation so fast it would make your head swim. And so they remain silent. And this is what I'm trying to say. Money at, at different levels affects people. Uh, they remain silent because they don't want to challenge their income stream. How many times have I heard people say, gee, I sure agree with you, Ed, but you know, I, I, can't, I can't stand up and make that stand where I'd lose my job. <laughs> well, hey, that was another thing. Uh, one of my listeners, uh, Lars, I think, he sent me a, a message, and, and uh, this is what it said. Uh, he talked about how the water is now being contaminated in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Yes. And the, guy, and the guys in the filtration business, like the, water, the cleaning up water business. So he said, oh, well, you know, it, it doesn't matter that all the water is really, um, really bad and is going to kill people in the Gulf. It just means that there's more work for me. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Well, they promote that guy to president, you know. He's, he's got the right mindset. <laughs> he's got the right stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what happens. And um, so you control people through money. And it's, it's a hard thing to say, but it's, it's true. Now, if you get in, in, into the banking fraternity and you have the ability to create money out of nothing, which, of course, all central banks do, and um, the Federal Reserve System in the United States is a central bank, and you have one there in New Zealand. The Bank of England is another one, and all the countries have their, their banking mechanisms, which people think are government agencies, but they're not. They're really private banks, and uh, they have been given the monopolistic power by their governments to create the nation's money out of nothing, just out of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible uh, situation. Now, how much power does that give those who can create unlimited amounts of money? Here in the United States in the last uh, year, we had an event there, I guess, a year ago, where they created, uh, I think it was uh, $700 billion or in one day. It turned out that was not it at all. It was, it was $13 trillion, and they, didn't, <laughs> they hit it all. Well, now, where did that money come from? It just came out of thin air. Now, if you've got the ability to create that much money and then give it to, to anybody that uh, is a friend of yours, and here's a loan or a, uh, a bailout or a stimulus package or something, whatever you want to call it, uh, well, you have the ability to control the loyalties of those people who are receiving the money. That's it in a cool. nutshell. It's called bribery, people. And if you've got unlimited money to bribe people with, there's no limits to your bribery. All right. <laughs> That's about it, yeah. <laughs> so it's so simple, and uh, it's so simple that many people cannot believe it. They think, oh, it couldn't be that way. Then, no, it has to, it has to be more complicated than that. And, in fact, it's not. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's another conversation I, I, I have with people sometimes. I think, you know, you've got to keep it simple, Vinny. You know, you don't want to get too complicated and all off in fairyland. And it's like, well, you know, I may be a conspiracy theorist, but you're a conspiracy fairy. Now, F off, <laughs> you know, let's get real here. This is a very dangerous situation. Any way you slice it, we got a, uh, a criminal banking elite full of the worst types of debauched, even, even to the point of being sexual and occult type people in charge of the freaking planet with all the resources and money that God can dispense. Yeah. Because and that's what you turn yourself into when you are able to create some, something of value from nothing. Yeah. You turn yourself into God. And when a human being thinks that they've got a God complex, they do things like burn down Rome. Yeah. <laughs> You're right on target. And, you know... Um, this isn't really a, a conspiracy at all. Everything we're talking about, Vinny, is right out in the open. This is not hidden. The, the ability uh, to create money out of nothing, uh, they call it monetizing the debt. They give it a fancy name. They write textbooks on how to do it. Every, every banking employee at the higher level, at least, knows how it works. Students studying money theory read textbooks and they pass examinations. They know how it works. There's no conspiracy here. It's just right out in the open. It's entirely legal. That was the reason for passing the Federal Reserve Act here in 1913. They made it all legal. So there's no conspiracy and there's no theory. This is just the way the world works. 
And I think that sometimes when you realise the way the world works, you wish that it didn't work that way. But unfortunately it does. So then you have two choices. You can either A1, adjust to the way it works, or B2, change the way it works. Or at least freaking try try trying. Let's try number two. (laughs) Because number one, you won't be around to change anything because you'll probably get exterminated. That's right. That's right. You know, it's like, um, you know, here's door number one and door number two. Door number one leads nowhere. Door number two leads leads possibly to safety. You know, make it, make your choice now. <laughs> yeah. Certain doom or possible doom. <laughs> yeah, and num- number one leads to slavery or death. Number two is darn hard and dangerous. Yeah. Okay, let's go for number two. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a crappy cake any way you slice it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, you know... Lenny, why are, why are, Vinny, why are we here? You know, why are we put on this planet? Don't we have some purpose? Is it just to sit around and, and watch things happen and, and pass judgment, or are we here to make things happen? Well, yeah, I'd probably say we're here to make things happen because, after all, as soon as we decide that we're going to make things happen, uh, uh, they happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and some people kind of sit back and they go, oh, no, 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 there's nothing really going on there. It's actually, you know, it's a waste of your time. Perhaps you should, you know, do something more productive. This isn't going to work, you know. The naysayers and the people who, who, who don't believe as I believe. Those kind of people. It yeah. doesn't matter what they say to me because you can have a look at what I'm doing and have a look at what they're doing and you'll see two distinct differences. One yeah, they sleep, done. they sleep better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and uh, I get a lot done and, and they don't. You know, it, it's like... Um, it's like somebody who knows about one particular computer program about how to make videos comes up to me, okay, and says, hey, uh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because you're not using this program. And I go, how many videos you made? And they go, oh, like two. And I say, okay, I've done 300. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they accuse me of, just, of not knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> Have you really made 300 uh, documentaries? No, 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 no. Three hundred uh, YouTube videos. Uh, oh. Some of them, some of them are like uh, basically mini documentaries. Um, okay. Things like that, ten, fifteen minutes in length sometimes, and uh, also film a lot of public meetings um, around my community and uh, upload them to YouTube so that people who can't make it to the public meetings um, can at least view what they're talking about. These are things well, like that. Well, congratulations. That's that's exactly what everybody needs to strive to do. Yeah. Uh, well, and that, that was what I that was what I really um, started doing, and it was it was interestingly enough, I was inspired by uh, American patriot movements and ra- and radio shows and all of that uh, to do what I'm doing today. Um, and I started that about three years ago. I uh, quit my job working for a large uh, telecommunication company and uh, took my eleven thousand nine dollars worth of uh, uh, mall vouchers, and I went and I bought myself a computer and a camera. And I started going out, interviewing activists, protest, um, filming protests in public meetings, uploading them for people to see, making uh, little mini documentaries out of them. And uh, now I'm doing the radio show as well. And, yeah, basically, I get to talk to G. Edward Griffin. You know, that's how that turns out because I decided... You know, because I, decide, because I decided that I'm going to do it anyway, you know, and uh, it doesn't matter what people tell me um, that I can't do because, you know, me and my producer have a saying, uh, I'm doing it any effing way. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's exactly what we need more of. And, um, you know, in, in along those lines, there's another consideration that I think we need to keep in mind, and that is that uh, not everybody is capable of this sort of thing, and that doesn't mean to put them down or anything. Um, some of us have more of a crusader uh, instinct than others, um, but everybody can do something, you know. And uh, as long as we do everything that we can do that's consistent with our aptitude and our uh, situation, uh, we have to do something. Now, whether it's being out there in the forefront or supporting somebody that's out there in the forefront, uh, it doesn't make too much difference. In fact, uh, I think before the last break I started to talk about uh, City Hall, and I mentioned the official motto of, uh, of Freedom Force, which was impotentes defendere libertatem non persunt, meaning those without power cannot defend freedom. Well, we have an unofficial motto, too, which goes something like this. Don't fight City Hall. 
when you can be City Hall. And that is what is behind our project City Hall, which is now underway. We're providing training uh, for anybody that wants to run for office. Quit complaining, quit whining, get out there and run for office, anything. Run for your, your city hall, your council, your ed- board of education, dog catcher, whatever it is. Get out there and start reaching for influence within the community so that you can have a voice in where the, where the community and the nation is going instead of just observing it and complaining about it. So I think this is very important. And for those who cannot actually do that, they can find somebody who can and then support them. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinny Eastwood Show on American Freedom Radio. And incidentally, the VinnyEastwoodShow.com, broadcasting live from the future. It's a criminal empire out there, and we have the head Don himself, G. Edward Griffin, on the line. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know what's funny sometimes is that I think about um, characterizations of these evil New World Order folk, you know, as if they're some kind of uh, cartoon-like criminal, yeah. you know, some 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 grave stereotype. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is I think they actually are. It's some, but But they look so much like everybody else. Yeah, they do look and sound uh, like everybody else, only even more so. Uh, most of the, um, I think the people who uh, we associate with the key positions, you know, the ones that we see in the news and um, before the congressional hearings and so forth, they've developed a lot of polish. I mean, the the, uh, the Geithners of the world and the uh, Greenspans and the Bernankes and so forth, they they got quite a bit of polish. And uh, if you meet them, uh, meet them at a cocktail party, you'd probably be impressed by them. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things uh, in the American Medical Journal, I believe they defined a, a psychopath as somebody who is very nice in person and uh, personable and that kind of thing, but they uh, often have no real depth to their personality and they don't have any, very many long-lasting relationships or uh, long-lasting friends, th- things of that nature. And uh, the, their uh, associations with people are usually strictly through business and it's the only reason they can keep connection with one another because there's that because they don't really have any real brotherhood or chivalry behind the uh, scumbaggery. <laughs> <laughs> scumbaggery, yes. Well, I guess that's true. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever the case may be, I've not uh, been able to meet any of these people close up and personal. So I really don't know. Well, I've ambushed um, quite a few of them, uh, like Helen Clark, who's now number three at the UN. Um, when she was, you know, we, we, we dressed up like uh, like real real idiots, you know, like uh, with press shirts and things like that, you know, like, like young wankers, basically. And we fit right in. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was when she was getting some award, uh, a double doctorate honorary award for law. Right. This is somebody who tried to pass a law in this country that would basically outlaw vitamins as a supplement. Uh And then she magic and then she magically winds up in the U.N. after stepping down from her um, prime ministerial post. You know, it's it. You couldn't be clearer that she's a freaking New World Order puppet scumbag, you know. And this is the thing. People believe that their leaders are infallible. They believe that they are incapable of being corrupted. They believe these things so blindly that they will fight to defend them even as they're being stabbed in the back. And that's the real tragedy of it all. And um, maybe that's what the book Tragedy and Hope is supposed to symbolize, you know. All the hope we have is overshadowed by the tragedy of people supporting people who who don't support them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do know what you mean. Uh... Well, I don't know what tragedy and hope meant in terms of Carol Quigley, but I think I think he was talking about the the tragedy of all of the um, 
um, the injustices of the world and the um, the you know the unequal distribution of wealth and all of the things that go contrary to the collectivist utopian dream. And the hope probably was that someday they would have a new world order and it would all be nicely controlled by a few people at the top who had it all figured out and all those bad people at the bottom who might disagree could be eliminated um, humanely, of course. Yeah. Well, and this going, comes on to the, uh, the chemtrail issue. And uh, one of our listeners, he, he, sent a, <laughs> he sent your documentary to the uh, Kansas City Health Department and uh, they wrote back to him, I am not aware of any public health consensus on the health risks of chemtrails, or for that matter, even one scientific slash public health body that has elevated this to the level of many other public health issues that do warrant immediate action above our present levels of response. So it's basically... Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so I love those kind of automated responses. Eh? I mean, do they do they have that like written down as a thing, or do they actually have these automaton type type uh, Borg uh, half cybernetic um, women behind the desk kind of punching this code into the computer? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there must be some kind of a Cretan crowd that travels around and does this in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, so when you make your phone call in the morning, that you get these responses. I don't know. I have to check into that one. You know, in, in your studies of uh, genocide and um, and you know uh, taking over humanity and then all of this terrible stuff that we know, what's the most hilarious thing that you've seen? The most hilarious thing. Let me think. Uh, hmm. Uh, let me put that on subconscious mode for a moment. I, hilarious. That's a. Let's see. What's hilarious? Um, hmm. Well, I, I don't know. I guess it's it's a category rather than an event. And I think you nailed it. Is when these people start humming and hawing and fidgeting and dancing and moving around to avoid dealing with an issue and coming up with all of these canned expressions the favorite one of which is, of course, we are aware of no information that would indicate that anything is wrong. That's, that's the standard answer. I, I guess that's pretty hilarious because you know that, not in all cases, but certainly in many cases, these people know full well that they're covering something up. But as we mentioned before, that why are they covering it up? Because they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose that cash flow. So they, you know, they prostitute themselves and their integrity, and they come up with these canned phrases. I don't know that that's really hilarious, but uh, maybe that's the best we could say for it. Well, no, you know, how it actually is funny is that you saw it coming, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you call up these call centers and you know what they're going to say before they say it. And when they do say it, you, you, you have that repetitive... Fr you know how some people have these kind of ticks, you know? And yeah. as soon as they hear one particular phrase or one particular way of saying something, you know this person's brainwashed, and, and the tick for me is just... <sighs> I, yeah, I just thought of something that really was hilarious. You know, uh, we did this... Um, video documentary that you mentioned, and thank you for that, called What in the World Are They Spraying, having to do with the chemtrail phenomenon. And one of the places that the producers went was to a pristine area in Northern California uh, where there's a volcanic mountain called Mount Shasta. I don't know what its elevation is, but it's probably, I'm going to guess, 12,000 up to 14,000 feet. Big high mountain. It sticks up there. You can see it for 100 miles away. You know, if you're flying, there it is off in the distance covered with snow most of the year, um, and uh, of course in the wintertime it's uh, covered with snow way, way down to the, close to the bottom. Well, to make a long story short, they have uh, water samples uh, taken of the um, uh, snow, the melted snow from Mount Shasta that goes back over quite a few years. I don't know why they would do that, but they have them, and um, they compared the chemical analysis of what's in the snow now as compared to 20 years ago. Well, there shouldn't be any, anything toxic in that snow up there. It's, you know, it's so far away from an industrial area. Uh, there, there's no uh, smokestacks <laughs> with, within a thousand miles. Uh, the, um, all the debris from Japan doesn't come over there, you know, and from China, I should say. And uh, so it's out there all by itself. And it, the, what you'd expect in snow up at those elevations is um, 
is nothing but water. And that, indeed, is basically what they found 20 years ago. Now, more recently, they found extremely high levels of aluminum, barium, and strontium, all of the things, exactly the same things, that these, uh, these engineers, geoengineers, have been saying that they ought to spray on the planet in order to control the weather. Those are exactly the, the very uh, uh, compounds and minerals that they've been talking about. So all of a sudden, they show up, especially aluminum. So when this was brought out in the film, uh, we got a letter from some so-called scientific group saying, well, don't you know that up there on Mount Shasta uh, they have skiers, and on the bottom of the skis there are, there's aluminum, and therefore, <laughs> that is how, <laughs> therefore, that must be how the aluminum got into the snow. You idiot, don't you know there's skiers up there? Now, if that isn't hilarious, I don't know what it is. Uh, well, first of all, we checked it out with a what if this sample was taken on a ski slope? Maybe they would have us then. Well, it wasn't taken on a ski slope. There was no skiing activity in that area whatsoever. But that is hilarious how people will go to such extremes to try and cover up the truth. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, I think it's more the fact that they think that you're really stupid. And so they make up the first even slightly plausible lie that they can come up with in order to distract you. Because they think that when, you know, you're uh, you're making this little documentary, oh, this person, they don't know what they're talking about, obviously. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just BS them a little. Yes, yes, that'll be fantastic. And they'll just, and they'll just bugger off then and I won't have to hear from them ever again you know <laughs> well you I think the truth is that when you run into people like that they're not really they're not really answering us or the producers of the film what they're doing is trying to put something into the public record that would be plausible denial they're not interested oh, in us they know where we know what's going on but they're interested in the casual reader who might say oh how about that aluminum and then they read that oh well then I wonder if that's true and so now they've you know they've completely pulled the plug on their um, convictions uh, they put a question mark in other words in there and to finally I think the goal is to get the average person to the point where they say Oh, I don't know. This is just too complicated. Maybe yes, maybe no. How would I know? Some people say this, and what about that? And they get confused. I'll go watch television and see Dancing with the Stars instead. Dancing with your death, partner. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I really think that's the whole purpose, is to just throw su sufficient plausible denial and questions in there until finally the average person gets so confused they just give up. Well, the average person's been conditioned to be pretty nihilistic, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a difficulty. We are facing a deprogramming uh, operation that has never before been envisaged, okay? We're talking about a humanity that has been programmed on very deep levels using sophisticated psychological propaganda techniques mastered by Edward Bernays and, and all his predecessors to basically make everybody believe in a form of reality that doesn't currently exist. And the basic point that we really have to get across to people is we have to change that programming. We have to replace it with something that's real, something that is actually attached to your world so you don't feel so lost anymore. Once you feel an attachment to your community, your society, your country, your land, your food, your health, you get more power for yourself every day. And you can use that against those who would use theirs against you. Okay? This is the point. We want to empower people to be strong, to be very, very resilient. Because it doesn't matter how many crappy letters of response that deflect our questions we get sent. We're still going to be on their cases, and we're still going to be talking to people, and we're still going to be producing works to undermine everything that they say about the world. Because it's all a big lie, and it is not worth people's time listening to it my very special guest g edward griffin ladies and gentlemen is uh, kind enough to give us a full two hours today <laughs> so you know i hope you're enjoying it i certainly am as heck as am on the vinnie eastwood show dot com join us in the chat room there and uh final segment coming up after this break at the Vinnie Eastwood Show, uh, dot com. Oh, wait, hold on a second. We've actually got one more minute. G. Edward Griffin, we've got one, one more minute. What do you want to say to people right now? 
Well, your comment made me think of that uh, rather well-known movie, The Matrix. So what we're dealing here is, a, is the real version of The Matrix. So many people have been tied up to that network, and they're living in the illusion that they think is reality, and we're offering them the red pill. And a lot of them say, uh-uh, I think I like that blue pill better. Thank you. Mm, mm, mm. I think the blue pill is a, is a depressant, and the <laughs> yeah, and the and the red pill's like an acid tab or something. <laughs> right, right. So you know, goodness knows what can what can open your mind and and, and what can't. Who knows? Yeah. It's a dangerous world out there, and uh, not least for your mind. Yeah, well, pass the red pills, please. On AmericanFreedomRadio.com and incidentally, the Vinnie Eastwood Show.com, proudly brought to you by GorillaMedia.co.nz. New Zealand's unconventional news. My very special guest, G. Edward Griffin, joins us for the final segment of this uh, rip-roaringly, fantastically awesome and various other nice adjectives show. <laughs> G. Edward, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I almost hate to leave this show, Vinny. <laughs> hey, um, I hate it that you're leaving too. You bastard. No. <laughs> 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 well, you know, um, it was interesting. We were talking about what kind of um, ties us together as a, as a humanity. You know how um, I think the person, uh, Joan, is it, uh, that helped to uh, organise to get you on the show here. Um, she was Australian and I was New Zealander. We have this kind of camaraderie, even though in general cases that Australians and New Zealanders would hate each other. But when Australians and New Zealanders are on the other side of the world and not just in Australia and New Zealand, we love each other. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that's how it works, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe it's the same with uh, Canadians and Americans. You know, if you if you if you're living in the United States and living in Canada, oh, you hate your neighbours and all that kind of stuff. But if you but if you both take a plane and you like meet in Ireland or something, you're like, hey, we're like brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody's got this kind of double standard about yeah. who who and what they care about. Universal and uh, truth, quite yeah. frank. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the whole point is we're supposed to be a walking contradiction because if you become a contradiction, it means that you can change anything about yourself, even if it dis disrupts everything that you were in the first place. Because I think being able to change and move with the times or even make the times change in themselves, uh, you know, Lord help us, uh, that would probably be the best function for any human being, really. Because yeah. it gives you the power to manifest your own reality. And also, I guess it means that if there's an apparent contradiction, when in fact there is none, uh, it means that we're not just uh, uh, monosurfaced individuals. We have depth and complexity. And uh, that what appears like a contradiction, in fact, is not. It gives us many facets of our personality and our interests, our talent, and that's what makes us human beings. And um, I'd rather be with a, a person who has apparent contradictions than one who just is, uh, you know, looks like it's uh, pure vanilla all the way through. Mm, 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 mm. Well, and, and the main principle here is just being honest, right? You know, I mean, everybody Fs up, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And, uh, you know, some people try and if they bag you and they, and they, they hate you for the rest of your life because you make one mistake... And it's, and it's just so silly. Uh, there's, there's some real uh, depth of value to the concept of forgiveness to the people who do you wrong. However, it doesn't extend to the people who aren't sorry. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that, that perhaps leads to a, a good concluding thought, at least from my perspective. I've mentioned before that we have um, Freedom Force International, and we have members in 68 different countries, and it's the most amazing thing, Vinny, that here we have an organization with people from all parts of the world, all these different nations, all different cultures, all different races, all different ages, all different religions. All, all, everything is so different about them, different languages even. And yet the one thing that binds them together is the affinity to freedom affinity to something we call the creed of freedom, which spells it out in such concise terms that everybody can understand it. That's the glue that binds all of us together. And I would just like to leave that thought. If anybody wants to become part of that, uh, that group of change agents around the world that have this, this vision and work together to really, to really make a difference in the world, not just complain about how bad things are, I hope they'll just take some time and come to our website. And that's www.freedomforceinternational.org 
org stands for, of course, organization. It's freedomforceinternational.org. I think you're going to like what you read and, and come on board and join with us. And, you know, together we really can change this world. Yeah, yeah. Good place to leave it, but unfortunately... But fortunately, we still have a little bit more time. So, <laughs> so you know, postu- postulating away uh, is the uh, is the key here sometimes on talk radio. So I'm just going to put in my two cents. I think that the reason why people um, why people's perceptions have been so warped is. Uh, a lot to do with how powerful the media has become, how powerful the control over information has become. So if the brainwashing to be docile, to not get angry, to not stand up, to not actually look deeper into things, if that's the process that people have been conditioned to follow, then perhaps we need to create uh, counter brainwashing warfare to counteract that. Because if you want to have a revolution, you want to have a revolution in the mind, and so therefore you'd need to have a revolution in, in the media to facilitate that. And uh, that's basically my goal. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to um, you know, incorporate with lots of other media outlets out there to try and band together because together we're very strong and we can pulse um, the same signals and, and uh, promote each other's works. You know, it doesn't matter because, hey, it's not a competitive environment anymore. There's only one big group of people against us, and there's just us versus all of them. And we're not each other's enemies. We are on the same side here. And the infighting has got to stop. People have really got to pull together and just do things out of gifting, you know? Just give somebody a banner on your website. Just give somebody 30 minutes on your radio show. Give time to other people 